We're live now. Great to great to start this out. Um, if anybody's jumping in on this already, if you guys are waiting and jumping in, please drop a, a comment into the chat window. Say hello to us and let us know that you're here and where you're joining us from. And then let's just make sure too. If um, let me know if you're if everybody's sort of seeing what they need to see um, on the screen and if we're hearing who we need to hear and all that. So I think we should be good. Um, can you guys hear me all right over there? I can hear you great. Groovy, groovy. Um, well, let me jump in and I'll do introductions and we'll just kind of get rolling if that's cool. Sweet. All right, groovy, groovy. Hey, rock stars. And uh, as as our wonderful guest Ahi also said, aliens, we're going to have an awesome workshop today. Thanks so much for joining us. And um, as, as I said, when you get here, drop your name in, say hello, let us know where you're joining us from. Feel free to tell us what kind of studio you, you got going or whatever you're into. It's awesome. Um, this workshop is hosted by OWC and Recording Studio Rockstars. And the theme of the workshop today is how to sound unique producing EDM in your home studio. We have an amazing panel of guests joining us to help us understand how to create unique EDM in our home studios. Or maybe we simply want to add more of that, you know, the things that make EDM sound so amazing to our own productions, whether we're working with a pop singer or we're producing a rock band. So our guest today, we have BT joining us, a Grammy-nominated DJ, EDM producer, singer, songwriter, and composer. He's credited as pioneering trance music and paving the way for electronic dance music, which is awesome. He also created the technique called stutter editing and has even made it into the Guinness Book of World Records for using the largest number of vocal edits in a song at 6,178. And I thought I had a lot of edits in some of my songs. BT's also created software um, and continues to do that with Isotope, um, bringing you Stutter Edit 2 recently and Break Tweaker, and also with um, companies like Spitfire Audio, bringing you the BT Phobos Convolution Synth. Uh, BT's productions and collaboration credits include artists like Death Cab for Cutie, Howard Jones, Peter Gabriel, David Bowie, Madonna, and Depeche Mode, to name just a few. Um, so welcome, BT. Thank you so much. It's really exciting to be here with you guys. Dude, it's great to have you here, man. I'll, I'll keep going around and making some introductions here, too. So um, Morgan Page is also joining us. Morgan is a Grammy-nominated producer and DJ with hundreds of millions of plays, multiple billboard charting, Beatport, and U.S. Dance Radio number ones. He curates and hosts a weekly radio mix show called In the Air on Sirius XM that's been running for nearly a decade and is also passionate about the environment and technology having built a solar powered recording studio. That is super cool. Morgan's interest so in teaching has also led him to join us here. And um, he has also created a, something called the Quick Tips series, 750 plus short form tips and also 50 plus blog posts that will help you crack the creativity code for creating and improving your workflow in your studio. And those tips are, are going to be available in in the link, which we'll share, and also um, on his website, as well as a beautiful card set that you can get from OWC. So that's really cool. And thank you for that, OWC. Yeah. Morgan, welcome, man. Yeah, thanks for having me here. Excited to get started. Dude, me too. And our, and our guest also today is Ahi, a.k.a. Chris Adams is an EDM producer and dubstep producer. He's an artist as well with extensive experience touring clubs and festivals. And he also has a wonderful YouTube teaching you how to create EDM and dubstep in your home studio and makes wonderful tools available to us too through sample and sound packs for production in Ableton Live, which you can find through his YouTube channel. Um, some of Ahi's collaborations and remix credits include artists like The Funk Hunters, Manic Focus, Defunk, 
David Starfire, and many, many more. So it's an honor to be joined by you guys today. Really glad to have you here. We'll, um, Rockstars, we're going to also have a full Q&A session at the end of this workshop, so please stick around for that and uh, make sure to add your questions in the chat as you go so that we can answer them at the end. I also want to give a big shout out and a thank you to OWC for hosting this. Um, if you want fast hard drives, um, you want fast drives for composing and recording, but you also want reliability for your backup so you don't lose all the hard work you do in the studio. OWC is a great place to go and find that for your studio. So let me see if I can get you guys back on the screen there. Could you tell that I was reading my, uh, my wonderful intro for you? Um, great, to, <laughs> great to have you guys here. It's a real honor to have all three of you here. So thank you for joining us. Absolutely. My, my um, pleasure. Yeah, so let, let's see, where are you guys joining us from? So you guys are sort of, we're, we're kind of all across the, the country now. BT, I think you're sort of on the East Coast, right? And and Ahi and Morgan? Yeah, I'm in uh, Vermont right now where I grew up, but uh, back to LA tomorrow. So just- Oh, groovy. Yeah. groovy. yeah, yes, I'm up in a small town called Ojai, just north of LA. Oh, nice. Awesome, awesome. I love Ojai, that's a great spot, man. Yeah, I live in a, a dome right now on a two acre farm. It's pretty chill. <laughs> nice. Very cool. I have a lot of friends that have done Vipassanas in Ojai. Oh, yeah, at the Ojai Retreat Center? That's exactly right, yeah. Yeah, I I've used to actually, live right there. I've almost done a Vipassana with a, a close group of friends in Ojai. It's a really amazing place. Yeah, it's super What in the world right is a Vipassana? It's uh, You take a vow of silence for uh, a given period of time, and so you go, and it's just, it's like a meditation uh or yoga type retreat, but you're not allowed to speak. So um, yeah. I have friends that have done it for two weeks and they say about, it's kind of like a whole 30, but for your brain. And people say that, you know, a couple days in, you start going pretty loopy, not being able to talk. But after that, it's, uh, you're able to go a lot farther in your yoga or meditation, whichever one you're practicing. So it's pretty yeah. cool. And as an artist, like really experimenting with perception like that, like change, like halting something that you're used to is really, it can really expand your creative juices. Like I used to blindfold myself for a week straight in college just to like, and I wouldn't take it off the entire time. Like I'd go to all my classes, I'd like walk along the wall and um, yeah, it was crazy. Uh, my hearing got so good by the fourth day in. Uh, I really recommend, I you know, those it. experiments. Oh, man, we're going to have a fun conversation here. I can see. Yeah. <laughs> no doubt. M Morgan, do you want to uh, you want to add anything? I mean, give a give Vermont a shout out real quick, you know? <laughs> well, it feels like nothing has changed up here. It's its own uh, social distancing. So it's like this is normal life up here. It, it's its own silent retreat. <laughs> right. Right on. Yeah. Well, I sort of think of the uh, the deep um, conifer woods, you know, the pines and the and the um, evergreens as being just sort of absorbing all the sound anyway and making yeah, things really I quiet. I actually did a DJ set yesterday in the foliage. So I just ran a ton of extension cords out to the woods and did the set out there as all the leaves were falling down. So it's one way That's to do great, it. That's great, man. Yeah. That's How great. many extension cords? It was like four. And then I used a, uh, I get one of those little Mavic mini drones to do all the aerial shots. Oh, nice. So wow. Fun. that that's gotta be cool, man. Did you, did yeah. you uh, record it? Yeah. Yeah. It's all recorded. So you post link to that or email me links. I want to see that. That's yeah. very cool. I got to send nice. it. I've, I've never had a drone here for, for full foliage. <laughs> so it's fun. Or was that one of those drones that like tracks you? Yeah, it can track you. You can like tap on yourself and then it can do a, a, a spin around like a focus track. Yeah. A loop de loop. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. That was going to be one of the questions I was going to ask you guys was um, seeing some of these just um, sort of the ways that you guys would either take productions that you were doing that that were more ambient and how they would interact and inform and some of the dance music you create and then also you i i saw that you were doing that more again um and bt were you doing that as well where you guys were really incorporating the beauty of the outdoors as part of the video content that would go with your productions i mean i'm a huge outdoor fanatic and i i love hearing it's it's interesting hearing in in uh, the your bio morgan about your interest in the environment and building a solar studio it's like you and i have been friends for ages I didn't know that about you. Um, yeah. So I'm a huge outdoor enthusiast too. Um, my my wife and I are both DMTs, so I've got close to 3,000 hours underwater. I I love. Uh, I've spent 
I like to say I've spent more time with sharks than I have with people. So I love being outdoors. Um, and yeah, definitely like I've incorporated a lot of drone videography into, um, you know, uh, music videos and things like that. Uh, prior to drones being these incredibly accessible things. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, I love nature and the outdoors and uh, I'm very inspired by it in my work. So it definitely like leaning into that inspiration visually, you know, as a counterpoint for music when doing videos for sure. Yeah, because I always feel like there's been this big divide of you're either in a smoky nightclub, you know, before they banned smoking, either performing in the same variations of a nightclub, unless you're playing at Red Rocks or at the Gorge. And then the studio is always this insular environment. So it's so nice to, if you can DJ outside or if you can find a way to compose, uh, it's so rare. It's something I want to do more. Yeah, yes. I love that. You Some know, of my uh, favorite uh, events to play at have been like these like underground raves like out in the middle of the forest where they have like the lasers going through the trees and whatnot. And then also uh, Burning Man, though, that's uh, a bit of a harsh nature area. Yeah, yeah. That's great. Uh, I had a friend here who was um, studying dome projections. That was her art form. And, uh, you know, Ahi, you were talking about living in a dome house. Have you guys, has have any of you gotten involved in, um, you know, performances that are actually, that actually involve dome video and laser projections? Yeah, I actually, uh, my, before uh, I started making a living as music, I was a, a lighting designer for a dome in downtown LA. Wow. Uh, where they had like full 360 uh, visuals on the dome. And then we had this weird invention called the space harp in which we were like controlling all the visuals on the dome and they'd have clients come in there, do dome shows and whatnot. Um, but it's, it's a really tricky setup and it's sort of hard to get a paying audience or, or I should say enough people into a dome to pay for all the high technology that it takes to put on the show. Yeah, know. right. Small. And I mean, I guess we're in a time now where who knows what's going on with dome. Yeah, this was like, parties. you know, seven, six years ago. So maybe it's it's improved. Um, well, guys, let me uh, jump in and, and let's see if we can get a feel for um, our audience, just what it means to create the music that you guys do in your studios. So maybe, um, BT, we can start with you since we can see some of your studio there in the background. Um, I've seen another angle of that, too, in another photo. It's a pretty amazing space. Can you describe it? You know, um, what? Around. Wow. <laughs> there you go. It's pretty crazy in here for sure. And the modulars back over that side. I can't really see it from over here, but anyway, yeah. That's four years of hard hard work, this room. It's, honestly, it's the first room that I've ever worked in that has um, sound treatment in it. And that's kind of the most amazing thing about it. I've typically worked in basements or closets or attics. Um, kind of an extra room in where we've been living at any given time. And the real revelation about this room is, is not all the synthesizers and outboard hardware and stuff. It's the fact that if you hear 40 hertz in the room, it's you hear 40 hertz in the room at the exact amplitude that's coming out of the soffit mounted ATC speakers and the, uh, the way that it's designed in here is unbelievable. So um, it's it's a dream to work in. It's cut my work time down so significantly that um, I, I'm, I can make so much more music working in a place where I can hear properly as opposed to like a reference on headphones, I reference on three sets of speakers, I listen in the car and stuff. So that's the real revelation about about working in, um, in this spot. So, now, did you work with a, a studio designer to get it to that point or did you t learn all the stuff and, and come up with your own design oh no absolutely in fact i mean it's actually a horror story so i i don't want to make i want i don't want to sell it as like something that was like oh we set out to it we we went through four contractors and three designers and it took four years i mean i'm sitting right now on um over wood you know conduit that's packed with quite literally tens of thousands of hand hand uh, soldered Mogami cables. It's this room is completely insane. And so um, I I knew where I wanted things to live kind of roughly, 
but all of the design, I mean, staggered three layer, staggered seam drywall, no parallel walls. Um, you know, the front of the room is at a 17 degree angle with a 22 degree angle trapezoid above it. And this is all a, a genius named Wes Lachaud. Um, and so he designed the, the clouds up here and all, all that. You can see the diffusion, the diffusion wall behind me that's all prime numbers. And um, I mean, this room, when, when they got all the treatments up and I just stood in here and clapped, it was like, oh my God, I cannot believe I'm gonna get to make records in that room. I, I literally, I couldn't believe it, like actual tears. So yeah, this is Wes Show designed this room. Um, he's an incredible studio designer. He designs rooms all over the world. Um, and uh, he saved us on this project, honestly. He really did. That's great, man. Well, and again, thank you so much for the invitation for all of us to come check our mixes in your studio now. Anytime. It's really generous of you. <laughs> Crazy. I swear, I mean, one of the one of the things that is is irritating about this room is I put on I can't listen to my old music in here. And I'm talking about like mastered released music or scores that people know and love. They have millions of streams on streaming services. I put them on in here and all I hear is mistakes. And I'm serious too. Like I can just hear all of the errors in in my mixes. Um, it's unforgiving this room. But when you're working from scratch, it's like you just, it's it's insane. It's, it's so inspiring. So that's that's awesome. Yeah, I'm doing a studio redesign over here. So you're getting me excited about all this effort of going through that. So um, let me jump to you next, Morgan. Uh, tell us about your studio space. Um, I, I'll circle back to and we can get more into like what what are the things that are required for it. But, you know, what what makes up a space for you? How do you like to work and what sort of stuff is in your surrounding in your space? Yeah, so I started out with a, like a two car garage and brought in uh, another person that would help with the acoustics and sort of the design of the space but it's hard to design because you don't know how long you're going to stay in your house for this is attached to the house so there's no commute um and it's been interesting seeing the pro and cons of you know commuting to a space like i've never had that kind of setup it's always been like the bt part of the house um either a, a basement a bedroom or or a two-car garage and before I've done really simple setups where we just hung theater curtains and just put a studio in there and some mm -hmm. modular acoustic things like some gobos. But with this, uh, yeah, I mean, Ableton is the core of my rig. Uh, I did the Pro Tools route for a long time and found that just to be a little complicated for what I needed to do in electronic music. And um, it's a hybrid of a lot of analog gear for tracking vocalists. But these days, a lot of work is, is done remotely. So most of the, the top lines are done with the vocalist and an engineer somewhere else. Uh, but I still really love the sound and the imperfections even that I get in my own studio. But I always find, you know, I've gone through different monitors throughout the years that I have to test it on the club system to really get a feel and every club system sounds totally different. So it's still a lot of trial and error for me. So I wish I had a setup where it was a little more dialed in, but it always changes, you know, I'll change speakers and then I have built the room around one pair of speakers and then it changes again. Um, it is a solar power studio. So the whole house just has a bunch of solar. So it sounds more uh, sexy than it is. It's just solar. Everything can, can pretty much run off solar for the most part. Um, it is harder with electric cars to power everything with all that. That's um, cool. I think I yeah. remember when we were talking on the podcast, um, which will come out later, um, we were mentioning that, like, I think Jack Johnson was another artist who yeah. had built a solar studio. And I just love hearing about that. That's great. Yeah. And, I, and I'm definitely a big advocate, too, of, you know, keeping the, the studio set up simple. Like, there's no vocal booth. There's no room a room b it's just it's one room vocalist things behind my shoulder um you know i've even seen studio setups where they put a rear view mirror from a car to look back and see the singer and coach them while they're facing the right. daw yeah i i right. wanted to try that <laughs> but um but it's funny because i think you can go you can go down a rabbit hole of of trying to make the most uh, complicated setup and then it's more stuff to troubleshoot down the line so um i've pared my setup down it's less stuff better stuff now that's cool. Well, um, it's very encouraging to hear you guys talk about these uh, different iterations of studio and just remind us that, you know, those of us who are starting out with still just a pair of speakers in a home studio and that, in fact, while I'm revamping my studio, it's just nothing but a tiny couple of little self-powered speakers and I'm sitting here listening in, in this like makeshift control room. 
Um, but that there's so much possible too. You know, even BT, you mentioning that, you know, some of your your big hit, hits were done in ways that you wouldn't necessarily, you, you just hear the mistakes now. And I think we can all relate to that feeling of some of us are just hearing mistakes all the time, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. Let me jump over to you, Ahi. Um, you have, you know, started mentioning that you're living in a dome house. And again, you and I have talked. You've got a really cool um, space. I don't even think we've mentioned, speaking of environments and, and you know, the relaxation of nature, the way it pairs up with um, this EDM production. But um, you've got uh, you've even got some chickens that will come in and visit you every once in a while. Tell us yeah. about your space. Yeah, sometimes uh, for breakfast, if we don't have eggs, I have to go hunt for them around the property. <laughs> That's right. I like going and look in bushes because they're free range chickens. Uh, but yeah, so it, this is the dome setup. It is amazing uh, how little reflections there are in here because there are no flat surfaces in here. So I sort of lucked out in that sense. There are some uh, imperfections here for sure. Uh, mostly that during the summer it gets hot. So I got a little uh, thing up there that's sucking out heat that makes some noise. Um, but you know, uh, as far as space goes, it's it's surprisingly non-reflective. Uh, also using that, but also I remember being in like more limited places and really using mo like really nice monitoring like uh, the sub pack and also referencing and span sort of allowed me to get these really professional mixes uh, even out of an imperfect studio space. Uh, I, but I like what Morgan was saying, I think a big part of it is referencing it in an actual venue space, like a club space or a concert or a festival space, because uh, that's ultimately where a lot of people are going to be digesting it in like its most maximum way. And, and so being able to go and listen in that space and then come back and know how it translates to your studio, I think is a really big thing. I know right now it's sort of uh, very difficult to uh, do that with uh, no shows happening, but still like when that does come back around, I, I feel like that's such a huge, uh, huge game changer when you can like translate, like roughly translate what you hear uh, in your studio to what goes on live. Yeah, especially I feel like the tuning uh, like if you, you a lot of times I'll notice the kick is way too low and way too long and I'll notice that in the club but I won't get that sense I'll, I'll be picking the wrong kicks in the studio environment sometimes yeah. and maybe the kick is an E or a D flat and it really should be like an F or yeah. something a little little yeah. more in that you, center. You, those things you really notice when you're like on the rumbling stage you know <laughs> uh, I've, I've really I don't know have y'all messed around with the sub pack at all I love it yeah I yeah. have, I have, yeah, yeah, they're, they're amazing. I, I actually keep one of them in, in my shop. They're, those things are killer. Yeah. I love those that like a chill out listening setup for me is some blue, blue Mophies and a sub pack I'll do in the house. And that's like, man, listening to, you know, film music or uh, any kind of bass music on that setup is like a full body experience. It's crazy. Nice. What's the blue Mophie? Is that a set of headphones? Yeah, they're they're my favorite favorite headphones. They have um active subwoofers in them. Um and uh paired that with uh pairing that with a sub pack is like it's a crazy experience. Um yeah. so now I, I know well actually I don't know. I, I I I'd like to hear what you guys say about whether you feel like you guys are producing um different music, uh, similar music as an EDM producer. Have you all tried all genres? And it's sort of silly for me to even make distinctions about that. But in the context of that question, you know, the title of this, this workshop is, you know, how to sound unique and produce an EDM too. So maybe each of you guys can talk about the ways that you can use these tools that you've got. I know you've got analog. I know you've got, uh, I know Ableton Live is a big part of that. And then, um, you know, I know Ahi has told me that having the DJ rig next to him is part of it. So it's almost like there are these stages. Um, Morgan, maybe you can jump in first and, and, t and start answering that question and just talk about the ways that you use all these tools to, to find your unique voice. Yeah, I think the, the biggest thing now is because everyone has access to really good sounds like with Splice, uh, it's, it's up to you to curate it in a way that's unique. So is it, how, do you, how you choose your palette and how do you take the, these kicks and these snares 
and combine them from different packs. So it doesn't sound like you just use the cashmere pack for it. Like if you're really trying to make it unique, I think it's important that you're also not, if you do too unique, uh, it's not gonna fit into any lane for radio. It's not gonna fit into a destination or a playlist on streaming. You certainly shouldn't dictate that stuff, but if you want to find an audience, um, I think you've got to copy some elements and and then you know pioneer a couple, like copy nine things and then change that 10th part uh, if you can. So rather than starting from seed, you're sort of, um, you're propagating, you know, you're cl cloning or you're, I don't know, it's almost like an agriculture terms. So you're not just starting totally from scratch because it's much harder to start from nothing. And you really are sourcing from other people's works when you think you're being unique too. You're just sourcing from different elements, stealing from different works. Um, so yeah, in my setup, my big thing is I, I came in as sort of an outsider to dance music. I wasn't a DJ that had residencies and I didn't come from that background. I started as a producer first and I started uh, working in radio. And my back door in was that I started a singer songwriter who didn't work in dance music and brought them into the dance music space. So my way of being unique was getting vocalists that, that hated dance music and I changed their minds. And so by taking people out of their comfort zone in the genre they were used to, which was folk and singer songwriter type stuff, uh, I feel like you could get a unique sound and it didn't sound like a dance vocalist with typical dance lyrics. So I think you've got to cross pollinate. That's the key for me to having a unique sound of electronic music. And it's very easy to just copy what the next guy's doing. And, and a lot of times it can work like that. But if you want to be remembered and if you want it to be a sustainable success story and you want to broaden the arc of your career and have a long career, you're going to have to keep reinventing yourself and keep making music that, that sets you apart and isn't disposable. That's cool. I like it. It's like you're, um, you've got the music that's created out of the computer and then your alternative instrument is the human voice. You know, that's about as expressive as it gets. Yeah, and I think a lot of guys, the big pitfall I see is that uh, you can get very stuck on just wrapping up the music around the voice uh, rather than zooming out, making sure you're focusing on the, the composition, the, the songwriting. It's very easy to get um, hyper-focused on just the kick or the snare and just getting the biggest drop. Uh, and it's a tough balance to get that all right. So I rely on collaborations to do that, where you have so much energy in a day to, to spend and your, your energy budget uh, can kind of get divided up if you focus, try to do everything. So I think we were talking about in the podcast, like the Rick Rubin quote, you don't get any extra credit for doing everything yourself. Right. Yeah. Well, we appreciate you guys saving some of your energy for this workshop tonight. So thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, let me, uh, I'll, I'll guide it around, but again, I encourage you guys to just jump in and, and just have a conversation too. So BT, you're surrounded by a whole lot of, um, synthesizers with keys on them still yet I, yet i'm sure you got uh, your computer in front of you how do you integrate the stuff to keep it uh, unique yeah so it's a great question and everything that is in this room is uh something that uh, i've known and loved and worked with for years and years and years from my profit five i've probably had that for close to 20 years a Jupiter 8 mini Moog everything in here at one time or another has been one of a very small handful of instruments in a setup so I intimately know these things with my eyes closed and so it's thrilling to have access to you know these analog instruments that sound completely and totally unrelated to things inside a computer and then have the power and access to these incredible uh, modern instruments like things like Serum and, and you know, soft sense and UA, UAD plugins and so on and so forth. Um, just kind of keeping to the theme of uniqueness in sort of, you know, your self-expression. And if you're trying to express an electronic music, the uh, I loved what Morgan said. I thought it was I thought it was really great um, about focus and about utilizing elements from uh, that are existing, you know, I idiomatically within uh, electronic music and kind of tweaking one thing to make it your voice. Just to add something to that, I think that something that um, really helps people to develop their voice is to listen and study a lot of different types of music. So uh, similar to Morgan, same, same, but different as they say in Thailand. Um, uh, 
I, I come into electronic music through a really, you know, strange route for, for, um, for lack of a better descriptor. Uh, you know, I'm a classical music brat. I went to conservatory. I was, um, you know, pretty much chained to a piano as a child, studied Suzuki method and, you know, learning soprano alto tenor bass writing and counterpoint and theory. And um, I was knee deep in bar talk when I was eight years old, which is a really weird way to grow up. Um, so uh, I discovered synthesizers and electronic music from the early, you know, progenitors of uh, English new wave from breakdance culture and um, I, I thought hearing those those early electronic records in the 80s, wow, these guys that I'm studying in conservatory, if they were alive now, you know, your Arvo Parts or your Stravinsky's, uh, your Debussy, Claude Debussy's, they would be using the things that are around me right now because ultimately they were looking for um, uh, an infinite palette, tonal palette to paint from and they were limited by by the orchestra so um i'm i'm a little off the rails here but my my point is is i would encourage people to study music uh would be the the best advice i could give to people um you know there's there's uh now midi packs where you can just grab a chord progression um we have uh ai things like scalar that are helping people write chord progressions I would like to encourage people in the polar opposite 180 direction to study and intimately understand music harmonically, stylistically, um, different idioms of music, what make them tick. And I would actually encourage people to study types of music that they don't necessarily like or want to make, but that there's something in it that they find interesting. and. Um, so uh, I think that studying music will help you make better music. It will help you make more unique music. And ultimately, like Morgan said, that is something that creates sustainability in the arc of an artist. So that's my two cents there. That's great, man. I love that. And, um, you know, when I think about, um, you know, some of the tools that we've got, you mentioned that there's, you know, you're making these incredible software plugins like Stutter Edit, which when I look at that, my mind is just kind of blown with the possibilities. But I think it's a great reminder that when you focus on the musical aspect and what you want to do musically, it helps your brain simplify. What, now how do I want to use this tool to make this make this music instead of just focusing on the tool itself, you know? Yeah, I, I love that. I did an interview the other day and um, the the person uh, interviewing me, it was with the Isotope folks, which you just mentioned, um, and uh, the person interviewing us said, it's crazy that you'll just talk about all of these things that you do in your productions. Like some people are so secretive about these things. And I said to him, um, I said, well, if you're like the sum total of all these secrets, then what really is your creative output? Like, it, you know the the thrilling thing is now is how these tools like 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 Morgan said they're all democratized. You go on Splice, everyone can have the same sounds, right? And so it is exactly to echo what Morgan said. How you combine these things? My a theory teacher, my theory teacher in conservatory, Satiris Vlahopoulos said, um, he said the same twelve notes have been repeated in every possible iteration. You know for. 300 years. So it's all how you combine things that have already happened into something that's new. And that just stuck with me forever. I was yeah. like, that's the coolest is to this day. It's like, it's all already been done. It's how you combine things into a unique aesthetic that is you. you that's know? great. That's great. Um, so um, as on that topic too, speaking of combining things, um, Ahi, you one of I, your productions that I really enjoyed was that that we talked about before a bit was the the song Splattermouth, where you're combining the didgeridoo into, um, you know, a production yourself. T tell us a little bit of, more about you know your setup and the ways that you like to stay creative and and keep your sound unique. Yeah, well, I can sort of go off of what uh, both BT and Morgan were saying is studying other people's music, and I'd take it like a step further is recreate 
other people's music. Note for note, sound for sound, go through that whole process, like really dial in and like, oh, there's this small little riser sound that I didn't even pay attention to that was in this song, but like without it, you know, it wouldn't have this like transition as smoothly. So uh, I have a whole tutorial on how to make any beat ever. And it's like, you go through with the waveform, you literally line up all the kicks and the snares and every element that you possibly can. And then from there, you strip away some of the, the characteristics of that. And now you've got like a, a baseline, you know, where you've got all these, you know, you've got your nine things that are similar, like what Morgan was saying. And then you can throw on your things on top of that, uh, that, that makes that ninth thing, uh, that 10th thing different. Uh, but recreating other people's songs, I think it helped me improve as an artist like so much. Uh, I'm more in the dubstep bass music world. So I was recreating a lot of Skrillex, Space Jesus, Space Nectar uh, kinds of songs. And yeah, I just, I learned a lot about cymbal play and about the balance of the highs and the lows that way. Uh, learning a lot about mid side stuff from, you know, listening to tracks and only listening to the side content, only listening to the mono content and really dissecting everything and, and, and treating it like a science you know, but it's still an art form. Uh, it's it's a combination of both, you know, for, with electronic music. Um, and then also another thing, how I stay unique and fresh is like, uh, I try to combine things that might not have been combined before. So like you mentioned the didgeridoo song, Splatterface. So like the first drop of it is a, is a trap drop. Oh, wait, no. Yeah, no, but so it's like, there's this new sort of trend in dubstep called rhythm, which is uh, more, even more aggressive robot noises than dubstep. And I, I, I can enjoy it a little bit, but some of it gets really repetitive for me, though now it's in the last like couple of months, it's changed a lot. So I wanted to take like a more organic approach to rhythm where I, I tried to apply like uh, didgeridoo uh, to this, this rhythm format. And um, yeah, it, it, it turns out really well on the dance floor. You know, people like have something that they expect and are familiar with, but then have this unexpected element that comes in. Uh, and yeah, I, I really love doing that kind of Groovy, thing. man, groovy. Um, so I, we got a question here too, which maybe, maybe I, I can get a, a brief answer from you on first. Uh, he, and then we can, and you guys can just jump in with this too. So this comes from um, Jameson. Um, and he asks about how you know how do you balance translating a finished mix onto iPhone speaker and studio monitors, um, which just sort of brings up that question which you guys were talking about before about making sure that things are sounding right in the club and everything, um, you know. And then another question which is similar, which is you know getting that unique EDM sound from your home studio that's still going to sound great everywhere from the car to the club. So I hear you had. You have some other great videos where you show us how to use some of the the um, Voxengo tools for that, and then maybe you guys can uh, BT and Morgan just jump in and, and comment on this as well. Yeah. So one thing is just checking to make sure uh, all the elements of your song can be heard on both the iPhone and on your studio monitors. You know, uh, particularly one thing with like low end is distorting it, but only like the second or third harmonic. Uh, so that way the low end can show up on the iPhone. I know that's that's something I learned from studying rap music and particularly modern modern trap like modern mumble rap does that a lot where they will distort the 808 but only like the second or third harmonic so that way you can actually hear it on iPhone speakers. That's absolutely right. I, it's crazy you said that. That was literally one of the things that I was going to say about saturation and getting second order harmonics. You can hear bass on an iphone if you do that i actually have thought about taking an old iphone and putting it speaker in the studio I i'd love to throw something into this too so it's a tiny thread hijack but it's related to this which is i'm a huge stickler for workflow i'm also like a big advocate of finishing things that you start because I think that there's something to be learned in the completion process, even if it's not something that you're necessarily proud of or you want to put out. You tell your creative self that you can complete something. 
I think one of the biggest pitfalls I see in young producers is they'll start 500 different things and then they'll listen to a YouTube clip and they're like, I can do something better. And then they start something else and then they go on Spotify and they're like, no, wait, I can do even better. And then they start it and they don't finish anything. So um, uh, just like a little thread hijack piece of advice is you should have an ideas folder that you literally are making time every week to finish things in, even if they're not things that you're proud of and are, and are gonna release. But just to address this iPhone speaker thing, um, I actually listen on an iPhone. So what I do is I sync um, my current project folder to Dropbox and I print a mix at the end of every day. And when I leave the studio, I go for a walk, I'll go get our dog, I go for a walk up the country road and I listen on an iPhone. And, um, and uh, I can tell if the mix is translating. But the, the advice that you gave about second and third order harmonics and saturation is awesome and so true, especially in bass music or anything that has subharmonic bass lines because they just don't translate on an iPhone. You're like, you're talking about like 70 hertz and up if you're lucky, you know? So that's awesome. I want to hand this over to Morgan, but I want to also hijack the thread and throw out a shout out to a um, tool that I'm using called Audio Movers. I don't know if you guys are using that yet, but it's a plug and you can put it on the Master Fader and you can live stream it over to your iPhone from Pro Tools or from wherever. Oh, wow. So it's pretty hip and it's very it's high speed and high res too. Amazing. I'm getting that when we hang up. Audio right. Movers. Morgan, take Audio take movers. it away, man. <laughs> yeah, well, something crazy I've noticed over the years where you can have the mix perfect in the studio and on big monitors, it sounds great. It'll even look good on your spectrum, on your scope, but it doesn't matter because the destination where it's going is really where it matters. Like people don't want to know about, you know, the process is interesting and it's romantic, but if you go to a club, a lot of times, even with all the low end there, stuff won't translate because their system has limiters on it. There's things that are designed to keep their speakers from blowing out. So the way they, their crossovers are set up and it's kind of a black art to live sound. It's a whole other world that's beyond me, but it's crazy to me that I'll hear stuff that'll sound great in the studio and you get to live and they've already, those super low kicks don't even work in a lot of club systems. Uh, they're already being compensated for and they're not, um, they're drawing too much power. They're clipping the limiters. So even those environments that, that do have that lower end range, it doesn't always work. And it's a very narrow uh, destination to be working towards. I mean, not everybody's gonna have a sub pack. Um, how, you know, I try to think about like Amazon Echo, like how would that sound on the most popular speaker in the world, probably. I think that's the most well distributed speaker beyond the iPhone. So I just continue to test in these different environments and there's no shortcut around it. You've got to hear your music in a different acoustic space. I think that's really important. It's almost like um, for creativity, you've got to cross the threshold into another room and just hear stuff in a different environment to, to refresh your ears. So that's just a good practice to do anyways. Yeah, I think that's great. And um, we have another question, which I can hand this back to you, Morgan. Um, this one's just sort of, you know, a general question, which is for a beginner uh, who wants to start creating ADM and trying to figure it out. And I mean, I think Ahi gave us some great tips already about just studying the rhythms and stuff. But, um, you know, you talked, Morgan, about the importance of finding that balance between using a template. Like you, basically, you do, I learned from you that you don't have to create everything from scratch. Like it's cool to go to splice and start and start with a sound that might have taken a long time to work on before. So just talk about that balance of feeling okay about using the stuff that you've already got and creating something new and using templates to create with. Yeah, I like to look at them as living templates. So I, I keep building and changing them and doing different versions of a template. So there's a, a remix template that I'll use. There'll be a pop songwriting draft. Uh, and I never use the templates that come with the DAWs uh, for obvious reasons. It's just those never have worked for me. I have to build them from scratch. So it's kind of funny. You're using a template, but you start from scratch. And that sort of is an iterative process over the years. You do variations. But I've also found that it's important to keep the templates so there's just enough and you're not locked into macros. I think it can get really sticky. You can get boxed into a corner if you over-templatize. So I get a template that has my arrangement markers in there, has the color coding, it's got the bus grouping, some basic treatments, a couple instruments to start with, where I used to have a really elaborate template. 
So I'll, I'll kind of meet myself halfway and that really helps with the process. Um, and that's really important to be able to have that workflow because you can over plan and then you're going to reduce your, your creative process. Uh, so I just try to take care of the plumbing at a time. Cool. You guys want to jump in with um, talking about using templates versus um, starting from scratch? I could talk a lot about templates. <laughs> yeah, me too. You, you go first, man. I've, uh, I've, I've, yeah. Yeah. I love, I love using templates. Uh, one of I actually, I sell, I recreated Skrillex's uh, template. He uh, posted a video of one of his uh, songs called Fu or, uh, Fuji Opener, or I actually know it was Mumbai Power. And uh, just from going through there, you could see some really interesting things. And in they're really particularly about how the game staging worked, how he had all these limiters on his groups and then he had like just vocals going directly to the master and so it's like creating these multiple layers of ceilings almost like a, a smashed cake uh up against a glass window with like the vocals being able to ride up and down uh for that and um yeah it, it it's just a, a really great starting place particularly like from for me from a mixing more from a mixing side uh rather than arrangement side uh, and I, I actually sell those uh, recreations of Skrillex's Ableton template and then a, a few of my own. Right on. Cool. Um, um, PT. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, hop, sorry for the inter inter interruption. I'm, I'm a huge advocate of auto loads too. Um, I may be the only weirdo on this Zoom call that is DAW agnostic. So I actually work in Cubase when I'm scoring. I have... Um, about a 3,500 track auto load in Cubase um, with a, a separate PC that runs um, roughly 3,000 instances of contact, all preloaded. It's got a half a terabyte of RAM and so it takes an hour to boot. It's a crazy machine, but it's like my Synclavier um, slash an orchestra. So um, I boot that only when I'm uh, composing for film, television. Right now, I'm using it for a video game that I'm scoring. Um, so I do that in, in Cubase because of the way that it's able to interact um, with with contact specifically. Um, then I also, like my fun DAW, so like for my modular over here, you can't really see that area. Well, I guess you can see it a little bit. The, my, you can't see the Euro rack, but the um, the modular area over there is all based around Ableton. Um, I have a Midas F32 and um, all this stuff has a clock, is receiving clock um, over expert sleepers. All my step sequencers are clocked to both uh, vintage and um, modern uh, step sequencers all around live. Live is such a fun doll. I've been using it to perform since uh, it was an alpha, like so pre live one, I was performing with it. Um, and people were like, is that dude checking his email? Like it, people thought it was the weirdest thing performing with a laptop. Um, and then my sort of warm blanket as it were is, uh, is logic. I've been using it since it was notator on the Atari ST. So I use those three DAWs kind of in equal measure. I do a lot of stuff in Reaper in surround um i use reason regularly i use fl for like kind of neuro stuff i love harmer so um i, I like am legitimately diagnostic so uh my point is here is every single one of those daws i i have very um powerful templates in so i can open them and um and uh, i can do what i want to do in that environment really quickly so I think that for someone starting out, the the very first big question is which DAW are you going to choose? And um, for people that are beginning, um, I always recommend both FL and uh, Ableton. I think that they're two of the most powerful DAWs, and I think that they're easy to learn. They're easier to learn than other DAWs, those two DAWs. And um, I would recommend buying templates to look at so you can get underneath uh, what is happening in songs that you like, and then uh, starting to build your own. And and really like look, I mean, some of the some electronic music is, a lot of it is way simpler, I think, than a lot of people think. Um, 
And uh, so it's really just about like, you got a, a drum group, a bus group, you know, a keyboard group, a vocal group, other instrument group, and, um, and uh, building templates that aren't overly telling you what to do, as Morgan said more eloquently than I did just there, but, um, you know, have enough power, but that you're going to go into and really adapt and add to dependent on the composition you're working on. Okay, awesome. Great answers, guys. Um, so we got a question in and we're, we're closing in on our final 10 minutes here. So we'll just try and get us, get some questions in. Um, Morgan, I'll, I'll throw this to you. This is from Jesse. And then you guys jump in. Um, Jesse asks, do you take the audience into consideration when creating? Or do you speak from the heart? In other words, do you make music for yourself? Uh, you got to do both. I think it's there's different stages of your careers where uh, you use can selfishly focus on yourself. I think you want to satisfy that first, you know, scratch your own itch, but uh, it won't be a long career if you only make music for yourself. And I think that's the reality of the music business is you will have to make some compromises. You will have to, you'll see that as you play songs out live, you know, where's the crowd getting bored? A lot of times you can see pretty quickly, like I've never played a song out and been like, cool, perfect, it's done. Like I'm gonna hand this into the label. It's always like, wow, I got to redo this whole thing and not, you know, more of a mixed down thing, but you really feel the arrangement when you're playing it in that setting where the destination is. And I think that can be trickier with Spotify and some of these other services where you're not, you're just seeing a play count versus feeling the electricity in the room. And there's that visceral feeling with people looking at you, 10,000 people reacting to your song at Red Rocks. Uh, so for me, that's really important to get that feedback. So, but I think what a lot of the mistake of a, a lot of artists make in their career is they try to, you know, quit the band, start their solo project, do it just for them, don't listen to the record label, don't have an editor. And that is the pitfall that I see happen with a lot of careers. And you've got to have someone has to be your editor. And maybe your fans are a uh, thousand or 10,000 mini editors that are helping you with feedback without even realizing it. So it's it's key to not just focus on yourself. You got to do both, and then you'll have to struggle to find that that balance of, of achieving both. I love that. Find your editor. What a great yeah. advice. Do you guys want to jump in on thoughts about that? Whether you're creating for yourself or for your audience? I'd love to. Um, I I, uh, I love what Morgan said there. Um, I think that it's a nice opportunity to kind of push back off the canvas and sort of look at the macro picture and ask yourself about your own personal why. And, um, you know, which is a really big kind of, we can get into big <laughs> existential conversation, but what it is that you're doing this for. And I think that the answer to that for a lot of people that express interest in electronic music is not because they want to you know, stand on stage in front of hundreds of thousands of people, but they feel this burning need to self-express and they love that kind of music and um, that it might be really satisfying for them to make something that they throw up on CD Baby and their friends and their family and a couple people check out and that feels great. And they have, uh, you know, um, a day job that's rewarding and it's it's something that's kind of ancillary part of their you know life process right so i think that it's it's really important to kind of push back off the canvas and ask yourself why it is you want to do music in the first place and specifically why it is that you want to do electronic music and then bracketing that with it affords people the opportunity to to kind of preframe that question a bit differently, right? Like if you're making music for yourself or if you're making it for an audience, because these days, uh, something like a streaming service, Spotify, we're not making music for an audience, we're making music for AI. And that's like a very uncomfortable conversation for people to have. But what we commonly refer to in the colloquial as the Spotify algorithm is actually artificial intelligence. And so that is curating what reaches people so a computer algorithm is deciding if something you've created is similar enough to other pieces of music to be funneled to an audience that ingested that music. So again, I could get into a long divergent thread about it. I'm going to <laughs> not do that. But um, I, think that, I think that in order for new forms to evolve, 
and for music to truly evolve and not become homogenized into these piles that are artists become irrecognizable from one another. I think that we need the kind of mavericks and breakthroughs that are willing to take risks um, and might not be enjoyed by a large audience, but pioneer something truly evocative and new. So I would encourage people to look underneath that question and just preframe it with why you want to do it in the first place. And if why you want to do it is just a part of your kind of humanity and self-expression, I'd encourage you to push the envelope as far as you possibly can. So um, you've got not necessarily dissenting opinions here, but just different ones. So that's awesome. Yeah. I, I can envision the future is, is you get all those AIs together in a big AI dance club, and then it'll be a whole new level when you guys are like actually oh live God. DJing for a room full of AIs. Yeah. Then no, you really know. I think it is it is tough too because if you have if the crowd is leading you and you're not leading the crowd, um, you could get really unhappy and, and be making music for people that if they want you to make the same music over and over again, you're stuck in a vicious cycle. So I think what BT said makes a lot of sense. It's like you've got to you have to balance both, but you you've got to be happy uh, to have a sustainable yeah. career. Yeah, uh, I personally I came from the world of like making IDM like more Aphex Twin style beats. And then it, it wasn't really until I started making music that was more danceable, uh, like bass music stuff, that I actually started to be able to live off of my music. And, and so it's, it was about, you know, finding that balance, like they said, between music that you're making for other people's experience, like in a live dance music setting and your own aesthetic tastes. And like, I don't dislike dance music. I love it. I love the experience. It was just like shifting my time away from like, oh, these more weirder experimental things to like, oh, how can I make something that I enjoy with other people, you know? And I, I think you're going to find uh, a lot of um, fulfillment when, when you can enjoy something with other people. That's great. All right, guys, we got about three minutes left. So let me see if I can throw one question, one last question here. This comes in from Zach. And Zach, I'll combine his questions. He says, as a beginner, um, he's particularly interested in like, what sound libraries or banks you guys might want to just, you know, throw out there for him to check out um, for beginners. And then also, you know, name some essential plugins that you think would be really cool for him to, to consider or for anybody. Voxengo Span. It's free. Download it. Number one plugin. <laughs> I'll go ahead and give a shout like, out for Stutter Edit. I think that that looks like a lot of fun. Uh, I mean, I'll tell you what, like Stutter Edit has gotten me over the hump compositionally so many times. Like if I put if I put Stutter Edit 2 on a stack of five stems, like I've got that dreaded eight bar loop and I put four or five stems with instances of that on it, I can instantaneously make an arrangement. Um, I, I give a shout out to Steve Duda. I think Serum is kind of a must in the modern workflow. Woo! I'll also give a shout out to Sean that makes the Valhalla uh, reverbs and delays. I think that those are must have plugins. Um, uh, I think these days you're gonna have to have, you know, uh, a sidechain plugin, Nicky Romero kickstarts great. Give a shout out to uh, Track Spacer, another sort of essential in modern electronic music arsenal. Of course, there's the 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 die like the holy trinity diehard. Serum is one of them. It's Serum, Silent, and Nexus. Those are the things that like pretty much every dance music record you've ever heard have been made with. So. Um, hope that helps i'm sure morgan you'll have some other recommends yeah well i love stutter edit too that's amazing i told bt earlier it's been blowing my mind <laughs> especially with stems that's a great way to use it uh i've been using shaperbox 2 a lot i think that's a really underrated plugin and that has volume shaper which is basically the nikki romero plugin in there he has a more simplified version of it but shaperbox you can i've only scratched the surface on it but it's unbelievable for side chaining and you can even throw a one shot sample in there and use the bit crusher and uh, there's so many different ways to mangle your sounds in there 
Um, and for all the my synths and things, right now I'm using Omnisphere. So everything within that says you can have the Keyscape, the Trillion, Stylus all within there. Keyscape's incredible. So just getting that whole bundle within Omnisphere, not getting lost in the complexity of it, but um, just the, these bread and butter sounds that they have now. Because I think Omnisphere was just these really big pads for a long time and kind of a rompler kind of thing where you were stuck with these huge sounds that were almost too big, they were better for film scoring. But now with all the Wurlitzer sounds, Rhodes, uh, and these hardware emulations uh, of the profits, it just, it just sounds incredible. So I end up using that instead of the hardware a lot. It's just a different workflow. Um, I, would, I would also so recommend uh, the uh, Fab Filter series, totally. uh, like the, the Pro L. Uh, and also the uh, multiband uh, are really great. And then also um, uh, the everything isotope ozone is excellent for mastering. Uh, and then also I've been really getting a lot of use out of Soothe, uh, particularly Soothe 2, which is like a negative resonant EQ with a little bit of artificial intelligence in it. Um, yeah, it, it gets really... It, it like tames really shrill sounds nicely. Awesome guys. Yeah. Well, in, in the interest of uh, respecting all of your times, uh, we've hit we've hit the end of our our hour. Um, I want to thank you guys all so much for being here on this panel with us. And before we go, let's let everybody know where they can find out more about you guys. Ahi, where can people go learn about you and um and go follow your great teachings? Yeah, so if you look up A-H-E-E, -E, Ahi, on YouTube, you can find all my tutorials there. I also have all my uh, Splice sample packs that are up on, on Splice. If you type in A-H-E-E -E in Splice, you'll find uh, all my stuff. If you type in Rave, also, I have like almost like the top 200 Rave samples on Splice. And uh, I am Ahi on Instagram for my more daily stuff. Okay, cool. And Rockstars, remember to check out Ahi's YouTube channel too. And uh, Morgan, let let everybody know where they can find your your great work. Yeah, um, at Morgan Page, pretty much everywhere on socials and morgan-page.com. And you can find uh, all the tips they talk about. There's over 850 tips on there now. So it's mpquicktips.com. And check out the OWC card deck that we did together. So that's really fun. It's a physically printed card deck uh, for really pushing that creative process, pushing the envelope. Awesome. And, and BT, please let everybody know where they can go look at more pictures of your amazing synthesizers behind you in that shot. <laughs> I actually, uh, I just saw we got a, um, uh, what is it? Computer music? Uh, there's a, a great computer music feature. And my wife just picked the magazine up randomly. When she sees it at the shop, she'll get it for me. And it's one that there's a big feature on my studio and um, on socials. I'm at BT on everything, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Um, my website's btmusic.com. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty easy to find. And um, uh, I want to give a shout out actually to OWC for keeping all of my amazing, amazing old rigs are like, uh, I, my my studio is like vapor waved out so i have i have this is important for me to give this shout out so forgive me if i go over here for a second i have a lot of os9 era computers and i have them hot rotted with ssds in them they're like some of the fastest computers i have i work on them all the time um and uh i appreciate so much them making ram too for all of these old machines all the RAM in my um, in my PC that I run this Behemoth Cubase Autoload is OWC. So I, I really appreciate what those guys are doing. And um, yeah, and um, everybody check out Stutter Edit too. Um, you know, the feedback on it's been incredible. And uh, I love what Morgan said about his deck is great. I, I use that thing myself. So Thanks. yeah, there you go. Groovy guys. And uh, again, thank you OWC for hosting this and bringing us all together and allowing us to do this with this incredible panel. You guys all rock. Ahi, Morgan, BTT, great to hang with you guys. I really appreciate this and I look forward to, um, just, I'm gonna, as soon as I get off, I'm just gonna go crank up my stereo and listen to all your music. <laughs> nice. Awesome. Nice one well, guys. Peace aliens. Ciao guys. Okay. Be safe you. you guys, take care.